Happy Monday, my friends. I'm so excited today to announce a month-long series we'll be doing on 3 and 30, and it's sponsored by a company that has been behind the scenes supporting me as I've built this podcast, and that company is The Mama Ladder. I started working with The Mama Ladder because about six months after starting 3 and 30, I recognized that I needed a business mentor. I'd started my podcast because I love to teach. I knew how to do that, but I quickly found that there was so much about running a business that I did not know how to do. I chose Krista Lee Beck, the co-founder of The Mama Ladder, as my one-on-one business coach because she had built two very successful businesses while also being a devoted mother to her young children, and that was very important to me. I loved her mission to empower mom entrepreneurs to take bold Bold action with big heart. During the six months that Crystal Lee was my coach, I truly feel that she accelerated my business by several years. So when she told me that the Mama Ladder was launching a six month paid membership program called Mama Power, I jumped at the chance to join. I was actually the very first person to sign up because I'd seen how much Crystal Lee's coaching had helped my business and I believed completely in the value of the education that the Mama Ladder was offering. I'm so excited that the Mama Ladder is opening up their next cohort of the Mama Power program this month, and they are the proud sponsors of 3 and 30. So let me tell you a bit more about the program and my experience in it. Mama Power helps women who are building businesses and raising a family get more done in their business than most people do in years. There's no business accelerator program designed specifically for mompreneurs like it anywhere. As a member of Mama Power, you have access to the Mama Ladder's approved team of professionals who are all awesome mom business owners themselves. They offer their services in areas like SEO for your website, legal contracts, tax preparation, and all of them are true pros at what they do. As part of the program, you get to choose three services you need most for your business, and they do them for you. The program also offers monthly interactive virtual workshops with business experts, monthly group coaching calls with Crystal Lee, and a ticket to the Mama Spring Break Business and Adventure Retreat. I attended this powerful three-day retreat in St. George this year, and I learned so much about business while also networking with like-minded mom entrepreneurs who've become my collaborators and my supporters in this work. So if you're serious about growing your business while being the mom you want to be, I invite you to join Mama Power. Registration for the next cohort is September 14th through October 18th. It will start the first day of November and lasts for a full six months through April 30th. I'll be telling you so much more about it in the coming weeks, but in the meantime, go to 3 and 30 podcastcom forward slash mama power for more details on the program, including details on a special bonus that I'm offering to 3 and 30 listeners who sign up. That's 3 and 30 podcastcom forward slash mama power, and I will put the link in the show notes. And now, on to the show. As I mentioned, today is the first in a series of episodes that I'm calling You Are Your Child's Most Important Teacher. I purposely planned this series for September and back to school season because while I love and respect teachers, I was one myself for many years before my children were born. I want to remind all of us that with the most important topics, We need to be proactive about teaching our kids about it instead of waiting for professional educators to do it. We're starting with the first topic that probably comes to mind for many of you. This is episode 99, How to Talk to Your Kids About Sex. Welcome to 3 and 30, a podcast for moms who want to create more meaning in motherhood. Each 30-minute episode will feature three doable takeaways for you to try at home with your family this week. I'm your host, Rachel Nielsen. Thank you so much for being here. I vividly remember the week that my little boy discovered his penis. (laughs) He had just turned two, and every time he was in the bathtub that week, he would touch it and ask me about it and play with it. And this was disturbing to me. Why was this body part so interesting to him? What in the heck should I say to him about it? Should I tell him to stop touching it? Or would that just shame him and create a bigger problem? And then the crazy paranoia started. Who has he been with lately? Had someone touched him? And that's why he was suddenly touching himself. Fortunately, I have a very wise mother-in-law and a very wise pediatrician who brought me back to reality. When I asked my mother-in-law about it, I remember her saying, that is completely normal. 
just tell him matter of factly that is your penis. That's what you use to go to the bathroom with. Don't make a big deal of it or worry about it. My pediatrician confirmed this advice while also adding to him, it's just like any other body part. It's like he discovered his elbow or his belly button. And hey, wouldn't you think it was cool if you discovered that you had a body part that hung off your body and sometimes got harder? (laughs) Fortunately, a lot has changed in the six years since my first nervous attempts at talking to my son about his body. I found that the more I just answer his questions matter-of-factly, the easier it gets. And I'm now honestly 100% comfortable talking to my kids about their bodies and about sex. I actually think it's one of the things I do best as a mom. And I really do want all of you out there to feel the same ease and confidence while discussing these topics with your families, which is why I asked Kristen Hodson, a certified sex therapist and mother of three, to come on the show today. Kristen is a true expert in this field as she frequently teaches workshops to parents on this topic, writes for publications like Women's Day Magazine, The Huffington Post, and The Deseret News, and counsels individuals and couples about their sexuality in her private practice. I'm so excited for her to teach us how to become the sex experts of our homes. So Kristen, welcome to 3 and 30 Podcast. Thank you. I am so excited. I'm actually, it's fun to be a guest, but I've also been a big fan so I'm having kind of a oh. dual experience of thrilled no. to be here. I'm like so <laughs> excited to just be here. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. And I just so admire the work that you do and the way you make it so comfortable and actionable and normalized for parents. And it is, it is like I said in that intro, it is crazy to me how freaked out I was when I realized that I was going to have to start addressing these topics with my son, because it does get so much easier with time. And so I'm hoping that with this conversation, parents will have some tools and scripts to use so that they can get more comfortable with these topics with their children. Yeah, I I think you are so relatable to so many parents out there because most of us didn't grow up in homes where talking about sexuality was modeled. And so we kind of navigated this element of our own lives. And then we, after growing up and realizing now we're parents and we have to, to teach our children this, and we don't really have a skill set both in our home or formally. Most of us didn't get mm-hmm. this information in school either. So I think there could be a belief that we should know how to do this and that there was some magical download that we might have missed out on when we didn't. Everyone's normal for feeling uncomfortable. And my goal is to empower parents to be the sex expert of their home and to see this as a development of skill, just like other skills Mm -hmm. in their life. And it's not something that you either have or you don't. Kind of what you talked about in your intro is you felt uncomfortable and you continued and stuck with it. You got some skills, you got some support from the people around you and you've grown in your comfort. And I would bet that your skill set has increased as well. Oh, yeah. And like I said there, I feel empowered as a mother when I talk to them about these things. Like it it sounds weird to say that it's like one of my favorite things to talk Mm -hmm. to them about. Uh But it's not not like just sex specifically, although we have talked about that, but like just about life and values and consent and being a good human. And it feels so good to talk to them about this real stuff and to kind of feel like I know how to do it. So why don't we start with your first takeaway um, so that other parents can feel empowered as well? So my very first takeaway, and you, you said it perfectly, is expanding our definition from sex to sexual health. Because far too often, like when I've talked to so many parents, they remember having the talk. They were either taken out to an awkward lunch. uh, Maybe they got a Hmm. post maturation program like dessert where on the fly we slipped in talking about what sex was. Some (laughs) people got their sex talk right before they're getting married. Um, But we think of having the talk with our kids of the big introduction about how babies are made. So oftentimes Mm. people are doing this around age eight. That's the most common age I'm hearing, which um, developmentally, that is a common time to talk about intercourse, but we are missing out on eight years of everyday conversations that we can be having with our kids from birth. And a lot mm-hmm. of parents are like, what can you possibly talking be talking to your kids about uh, uh, starting at birth? And it's sexual health. So when we think about sexual health and not just sex, 
uh, which is intercourse, the, the way that most people think about it. We're teaching our kids values. We're teaching them health and hygiene. We're teaching them about healthy relationships and consent and anatomy and boundaries and communication and puberty and reproduction and all of these things are sexual health. And we need to um, take the opportunity to have a thousand one minute conversations across their lifespan. Um, mm-hmm. Because this is an important piece and, and this statistic is always mind blowing to me. I, I'm not a mathematician, I'm a therapist. Um, however, I can do some basic math. And that kids starting in kindergarten up through 12th grade are getting on average around, I believe it's a thousand hours a year. And it's a lot of time that they're getting information for reading and math. They're starting with letters and then they're putting those letters together to form words and they can develop in that skill set of reading and get nuanced. Like it's embedded into their Mm -hmm. soul. When it comes to sexual health information, kids between kindergarten and 12th grade are getting 17.2 hours of education. That's about an hour. uh It's about an hour a year. So probably not going to sink in, going to be very hard to have that be embedded into their soul and their being and their makeup when they're getting such limited information. So when we think Mm -hmm. about sexual health, we can start to plant these amazing building blocks, just like we do with reading and math, and build on concepts. And as they grow and their circumstances become more challenging and their brains develop, we can add more nuance and complexity because we've given them this rich foundation of sexual health conversations and information from the moment they're born. Hmm. And I know as parents hear this, they're thinking, yes, like I want to do that. Um, how do they come? How do you become aware of those moments that are teachable moments or that are an opportunity to take a simple question and and teach them something a little more about their body or about the world. I mean, you kind of have to be on the lookout for these things. So how do you find those? So there's two types of conversations that I have parents prepare for. One are going to be the responsive. For example, I too have uh, the penis story with my son and he (laughs) came, he was enthusiastic from the bathtub and he's like, mom, come look at my penis. Look at what it's done. It's grown. (laughs) And I went in there and I'm like, that is amazing. And you know, what's cool about your penis is it will grow and it will shrink. And, and that was it. And he's like, cool. Basically. I mean, he was little because they can get erections from birth. They get them in utero, but that's a responsive conversation where I am responding to a situation that has presented It could be a situation, it can be a question, it could be something that you're hearing on the radio together and you are responding. Um, And 99% of what our kids need in those moments is to know that we are there to answer their question and we're not shutting them down. We don't even have to Mm. know all the information. If we're just willing to answer their question, even if we don't know the answer or we're uncomfortable, in responsive conversations, we can simply say, you know what, that is a great question. Give me a minute to gather some information and we'll talk. Or, oh, I'm so glad you talked to me about this. Or, yes, that's your penis. There's a lot of ways that we can respond positively, which tells them we are safe and approachable when it comes to sexual health and their bodies Mm -hmm. and anatomy. Like, that's what they need to know. The content or the accuracy is honestly secondary to them being able to feel safe with you in their relationship about their development around sex. Yes. And one thing that I love that you often teach is to make sure that they know that you're happy that they asked. Because I think even in that example with my son, I was so nervous about it and didn't know how to respond to it that it was very clear to me quickly that he was picking up on my nervousness about it. You know, then I saw him like, kind of being secretive about wanting to touch it in the bathtub because I was being weird about it. Yep, and I'm yep. like, oh, no, no, no. Like, this is the last thing I want is for there to be shame and secretive. So that's when I'm like, I reached out to a few people to ask what I should do. And so I think just having a more open, I'm grateful that you asked this question, even if I don't know the answer. I love that you pointed that out is super important. Yeah. And and the next with that, and 
you you're teeing this up really well uh, because the next kind of conversation or how we teach our kids are the proactive conversations where we are leading the conversation because mm. you we all are going to have that child um, that is super curious comes to us for everything asks all the questions and then we're going to have that child that isn't going to ever come to you that isn't doesn't want to talk to you and it's it's just their makeup it has nothing to do it's not indicative of uh, the lack of connection or safety they feel with you that's just them so Mm. some parents will want to rely on their child to lead those conversations or to be expressive about um, the questions they have or what's going on with their body but we really need to be proactive in leading conversations by understanding what's developmentally normal and knowing what's happening at zero to three, uh, three to seven years old, eight to 12. Like I just did a a series on what do you need to be talking to your kids about before they start junior high? Because Mm. there's a different level of exposure they have in a junior high setting. And so those are the proactive conversations. So you reached out to a pediatrician to do two things, to to understand if this is normal, to have that pediatrician mirror back that yes, it is normal. It is also age appropriate and Mm -hmm. part for that age group. So if we know what's developmentally normal, we can start to prepare like, you know what, we're having a lot of conversations about anatomy, but I really need to bolster up and have some conversations around consent because that's Mm. not coming up naturally. So I need to lead that. Um, And so we need to be able to be prepared with these two, the responsive, which are taking advantage of the natural opportunities that present and the proactive, which really puts us in the front seat of being the teacher in our children's lives around sexual health. And I cannot yes. emphasize that enough. Yes. And I um, I appreciate you pointing out the difference here because I do think my son has made it really easy on me. I'm glad he's my oldest for this reason. <laughs> like, okay, I need to rephrase that. He has not made life easy on me. He is an intense personality. <laughs> but in mm-hmm. this topic, um, he's made it easy on me because he's always asked so many questions. So it's... Yes. It broke me in to talking about this because he would just ask and I would just answer. And he, I noticed he wasn't weird about it when I just answered him. And he was like, it, it didn't have all this emotionally charged baggage that we have with it as adults. So then I'm like, oh, he was fine with that. So then the next question he asked, I could answer. And so it got easier and easier. Um, Whereas some children may never ask those questions. So if the only advice that parents are given is, well, just answer the questions when they come up, answer them honestly. What if the questions never come up? Then what are those parents supposed to do? Yeah, exactly. And that's really important because I have many friends who they're their oldest child, they'll say to me, you know what, they've never brought it up. I just don't even think it's on their radar. I don't think they're thinking Mm -hmm. about it. And I will always say, if they are interacting with any kids in a variety of situations, whether it's daycare, church, school, they are being exposed to a variety of words and values and phones, like it's everywhere. So Mm. it, it, it really is do we want our kids to learn from us or from their peers? Um, but they are learning about it. It is on their mind, despite mm-hmm. them talking to us about that, which you brought up something and it, and it really leads. I hope this is okay to move into my takeaway number two, which yes. is how our own sexual history influences mm-hmm. how we're approaching our children. Because we all grew up and developed our own experience, feelings, ideas around sexuality. And a lot of us have shame that we haven't identified or we have embarrassment or awkwardness. And our children, like you've talked about with your kids, they feel totally normal about it. But then they Mm. pick up on from us, they pick up on our awkwardness and they don't feel weird, but they learn to feel weird about it because we feel weird about it. Yes, And so a place I spend with a lot of parents is you can learn the skills all day long, but if you aren't even taking a moment, even if you're not recognizing your places of awkwardness or you might be comfortable with certain aspects of sexual health, but others you're avoiding, understanding your own sexual development 
mm. is really critical because our kids ping on our stuff that's unresolved. They hit mm. areas that were like, oh, I don't want to go there. And so we might try to manage them because we don't want to have to deal with ourselves. So we might suppress a behavior. We might try to redirect or do something because we don't like what it brings up in us. So we get them to stop it so it makes us more comfortable. So yes. oh, that makes total that sense. That is really important. And I've been doing a lot of work with people to understand their, their root of shame and to see how that presents in their everyday lives with how they're guiding and teaching their children or in their relationships. So doing some work around your own history, the kind of conversations you had, what was it like in your home, the messages you got at church, all these different things influence how we're interacting with our kids. Mm. And so when you say to like do some work around that, like what does mm-hmm. that mean? If somebody wants to wants to do work, how do they do that? Well, so you can really do some, even journaling, even having, even, so you can do formal therapy. However, I believe a Mm -hmm. lot of people, like you push through some awkwardness by simply being willing to acknowledge that you felt awkward, you felt uncomfortable, and that you didn't want to have shame. So that's one piece is just being aware and choosing a different Mm -hmm. narrative. The other is I've got a whole series of questions that I guide parents through to help them start to become aware of their history, the messages they were given, um, what their parents did well, things they, the conversations they wish they had. And what Mm. people find is they're like, Oh, I actually hadn't thought about this part of my history. Um, some people will say, I didn't, I don't have a history. This was never talked about in my home. And I'm like, that is your history. That is a history. Yeah. (laughs) That is a history. The absence of talking about sexuality in a home is a history and that could be influencing which then really shapes the values in which we're leading our children of how wh- where do we want to take our kids when we envision them as sexually healthy happy adults that are good human beings what do we want for them and our history can often influence that and does influence that so the idea is to take the unconscious and make it conscious through questions through conversations with our friends that we feel safe to start exploring how we grew up Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of podcasts so you can do the work both informally and formally but it's Mm -hmm. such i spend in my course on this the whole front end having parents recognize that this begins with you. You mm. you have to do the work that, that was left undone while you were being raised. And you have to tend and do to yourself. You have, and do you have a blog post um, with those questions for people to go through? Or is it is it somewhere where they could access it? So it's in the back of my book, Real Intimacy. However, mm. I I would love to just get you those questions so that they okay. have that as a, a download as they're listening to this podcast. And for those that do want to do that, they've got something yeah. as a tangible takeaway right there. Yeah. Oh, that would be awesome. So if you could send those to me, I'll link that in the show notes and then people can have those questions awesome. um, to go through. Thank you so much for that. Um, and then what is your third takeaway? So the third takeaway is to view talking to our kids about sex as a skill. I kind of talked about this with my first takeaway, but that Mm. you really can learn uh, how to be an expert in your own home, that you can develop a skill set by learning how to have these proactive conversations, by having prompts and scripts of talking to your kids Mm. about pornography, to leverage this as a skill set, much like learning any other skill or hobby. And if you are going to run a 5K you probably are running often and regularly. You're probably not just going out for one jog and imagining that you can do that 5K. You build up Mm. to it. You get coaches. You're reading things on it, but you're growing in your ability. This is is absolutely no different. It's Mm -hmm. not something you have or you don't. So I like parents to get empowered with skills, which does take... That is, while that's a takeaway, I'm not going to be able to give you all the skills in 10 minutes on this podcast, but I can plant <laughs> yeah. the seed to see this as a skill and give them um, one skill that I believe is very relatable to every single person that I'd, I'd actually like to do with you. 
Oh, perfect. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so here's, I call it the grocery store challenge. And mm-hmm. what I want you to do is I want you to take, I have everyone get their grocery list or to think about the most common items they get from the grocery store. Seven or 10 items such as milk, cheese, butter, eggs, rice, and write them down. Okay. So you have um, your list? T- yes. You gave me a little bit of warning on this one. So I have my list right now in front of me. Okay. Um, it's milk. Oh, should I say them or not? Yep. I want you to just read your list right now. Okay. Milk, cheese, eggs, bread, chicken, tortillas, apples. Okay. So when you read that list, did that feel comfortable? Yes. Did totally. you hesitate? No. Okay. Could you call up your mom and read this list of grocery items to her? Um, could I? Yeah. <laughs> like without Would you sh- hesitate yes. or, or would you yes. like, uh, I don't say chicken in front of my mom. Um, oh, I okay. see where you're going with this. No, okay, so I wouldn't I, hesitate. You wouldn't hesitate. Okay. So I've got another list of words mm-hmm. and the words are penis, vagina, scrotum, nip- nipples, orgasm, vulva, clitoris, and testicles. And I want mm-hmm. you to read these okay. out loud, Rachel. Okay. <laughs> penis, vagina, scrotum, nipples, orgasm, vulva, cl- clitoris, testicles. Okay. How did that feel to you? Um, it felt okay to me because I did a little bit of mental prep before the interview. <laughs> so <laughs> what's funny is I, when I wrote out my introduction, I, I said, I remember the day, the week that Noah discovered his private parts is what I had written. Oh, okay. and, then I, and, and then I was like, am I going to say that? Why don't I just say penis? And I was like, I can't say penis on the air. And I was like, why not? <laughs> it's, you know, like the doctor said, it's like an elbow or a belly button. Like why? Yep. So then I changed my intro and I put penis penis in there so I kind of mentally prep myself for it because it's true like these words are just kind of charged and it feels awkward to say them and there are still some on that list that um like vulva is a hard one for me for some reason like Uh I don't know why certain words make me more uncomfortable than others but I think that it's good to have awareness around that Absolutely. And this is where, so this does a few things. This brings up the awareness because this list of words, the sexual health words, your goal should have those be as comfortable as your grocery store list. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then though, I brought up your mother because you could say chicken rice eggs to your mom, but could you say, mom, I want to read a bunch of sexual health words to you. And it might (laughs) feel different and it might feel different to your dad and it might feel different in these different situations So this is a skill where I say, okay, you've now got your grocery store list. You now have your sexual health words list. And I give a lot longer list in my, um, in my course, but your goal is to say these out loud to where Mm -hmm. they're rolling off your tongue, just like your grocery store list. And I do have some people that are like, you know what? There's some words on that list that I actually don't know what they are. And I'm like, awesome. You've now also identified a place where you can go get the education that you've never gotten and Mm -hmm. grow in your, your understanding of sexual health. So this grocery store challenge does a lot of things and gives a really tangible skill for people to increase their comfort. Um, because there's a reason why knowing, having, teaching our kids actual terminology Because when they're describing if they have an irritation or an infection or if there is abuse going on, if they can't accurately describe what's going on, it's hard to know what's going on with their body. Mm. And the research does show that if someone is um, grooming or attempting to abuse a child, if they're using accurate terminology, they know there is an adult in their life that they are in communication with and that they're not an ideal candidate to hold a secret like abuse. Does that make sense? Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I have heard that that kids are much less likely to be sexually abused if they have had thorough like sexual health conversations with parents. Yep. That 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 alone makes them a less likely candidate to be targeted for sexual yep. abuse, which is crazy, but so empowering as a parent to think of course, we there's no guarantee and stuff can still happen, but we can at least teach our kids and give them as much of knowledge about their own bodies and about what's okay 
for other people so that they're so, they're somewhat protected from that. Absolutely. It, it really does move from, it moves people from a, a position of being scared and afraid and just hoping um to empowered and being proactive and feeling like, you know what, I am going to lead my child through this. I am going to help them navigate. And while I can't prevent everything or things that are out of my control, I can do everything in my power for the things that are in my control. And yes. having these sexual health conversations with my kids is in my control. Yes. Another question that I had when we're in this takeaway about skills, developing skills to lead these conversations is I do think scripts are extremely helpful. Yes. Um, so like for me, when I figured out, I had to kind of figure out how I was going to describe sex to my young children. And it took a little bit of like thought, you know, so my son did ask me how a baby, you know, gets into my when I was pregnant with his sister, how did she get in there? And it took like a little bit of thought for me. And I and I said, mommies and daddies put their private parts together, which seemed like a good answer for a three year old, you know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. And so that became a little script. I'm like, okay, now I have that script that I can use when I'm talking to him and my daughter. And it made me more comfortable. And I, I know that script needs to be more detailed as they get older, but what are some of, do you have examples of good scripts for people as they're just getting started with these conversations to how to even explain what sex is to children? Yep. Um, I, and I love that because you've introduced it and you can now have, I call it the s'more concept where you can have some more conversations when he's five, like, remember how we talked about this? Your private parts Mm -hmm. are now these, um, and you can build on it, but some of the scripts, some of the the recommendation I actually make for parents who are just starting these conversations is to start with books. Sitting down with a book with a three-year-old where it's got pictures. Um, my favorite book is Who Has What to teach mm-hmm. about anatomy because it's this okay. little family that's going to the beach and they've got swimsuits and they've got the dog and they normalize Every, it's so great and it's just an everyday situation that they turn into an opportunity to talk about whose body parts have what. But it allows parents to get comfortable leading a conversation, saying the words, but there's a guide. They're not having to free form these conversations. Mm, so yes. it, it lets them get some practice with some really good support. And so that's actually, scripts are important, and but... Um, starting with some books can be some of the best places to start. And I've got a, if you go to my Instagram, I call it my Mary Poppins bag and I pull out all my favorite books on sexual health. And I tell people they should have more books on sexual health than they do cookbooks. Now cookbooks are kind (laughs) of like people have Pinterest, but it gives them an idea. Um, So, and other scripts, because you're going to have some listeners that they've got a 12 year old and they've not had that conversation Yeah, are older. And they're like, can I still, is it too late? And it's never too late. And one of the script prompts I have uh, that I give parents with older kids is, you know what? I realize that I have never really had this conversation with you about sexuality or sexual health. And it might be a little awkward for both of us because I've not talked to you about it and it's new for me too. But there's a few things I want to start and I want to get through this together. Now that's like mm. a big script, but having that breaking the silence script is really important and a, a really helpful way to do that is, hey, I realized I've never talked to you about this. There's an mm. ownership of that adult and the kids aren't like, you're not just throwing it on them if you've not had that uh, relationship. Mm-hmm. And it owns the the newness of it and the uncomfortableness of it. And it models something really important, which is vulnerability and the safety. And that just because something's awkward doesn't mean we avoid it, that, that we can mm-hmm. get through it together. So I think scripts are incredibly important. So I, in my fundamentals course, I've got a whole list of responses that can be your responsive scripts. And I have people take three or four that they can see themselves saying. 
so that if they're caught mm-hmm. off guard or if they're in a, a new situation, they've got something they've practiced. And if they need to lead a conversation, here's a whole list of ways you can start the conversation based on your child, based on your comfort. Because what's key with these scripts is getting words or scripts that you yourself feel comfortable saying and would actually say. Um, yes. That's what's most important. Not how I would say it, not how Rachel says it, but to take what maybe they've heard us say and now find their version. Yes. Well, and I think this is a great time for you to tell us a little bit more about your courses and the resources that you have for families. I, I think these three basic takeaways are such a great start for parents and hopefully we'll get them thinking, get them a little more open and comfortable to the idea of talking about these things. But if they want to dive deeper, tell us yeah. about your other resources. So the first, I've got these three courses as a, in a response to after doing so many workshops and seeing so many clients that I wanted to to help as many people as possible. So the first one is my fundamentals course, um, which is, yes, you can talk to your kids about sex. Everyone mm. can, and I hope everybody does. And then from there, once they've got the fundamentals, then they can go deeper with more specific areas. Um, My next one is exposed, which is talking to your kids about pornography and sexually explicit media, which then naturally led to a course on masturbation and finding clarity in the conflict that many parents feel around that. So those are the Mm -hmm. three course offerings I have to really empower parents and give them skills and confidence and scripts and all of these things. Um, Mm -hmm. so they have it. Perfect. Well, Kristen, thank you so much for not only coming on three and 30, but for doing this work. And I love on your Instagram, how you are so open and you model for us that this isn't shameful. Our own sexuality isn't, and the sexuality of our children isn't shameful. It's so important that we have women doing this work. So thank you for all you're putting into the world. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. It's been a total pleasure. Many thanks to Kristen Hodson for a great discussion on this super important topic. I will link to her website in the show notes if you'd like to dig into more of her work. And by way of a recap, here are her three takeaways for becoming the sex expert of your home. First, expand your definition of sex to be sexual health and have a thousand one minute conversations with your children about sexual health over the course of their lifetimes. Second, become comfortable with your own sexual history and development so you're comfortable talking about these topics with your kids. And Kristen has graciously offered a list of questions um, exploring your sexual history that you can find a link to in the show notes. And I will send it out with my weekly email if you're signed up to receive that. And finally, takeaway number three, view talking to your kids about sex as a skill that you will get better at with practice. Practice using anatomically correct words like the grocery store challenge that she did with me until they roll easily off your tongue and get lots of books and children's books around the topics of sexual health. And I am going to send out a list of some of my favorite books on these topics in the email later this week. Well, maybe not this week because my week is swamped. I will compile that and send that out by the end of the month. So get on that list. We can do this, mamas, and we must. We, along with our partner, if we're lucky enough to have one, are our children's most important teachers, and they need us to get brave and to talk to them about some of the tough stuff. I love you all. I'm rooting for you, and I hope you have a great week with your family. 